Okay, let's go ahead and get into our study this morning. Um, Hebrews chapter 9. I think it would be good for us just to step back and go back into chapter 8 again and read verses 9, or excuse me, 7 through 13. So let's take a quick read of that and then we'll get into our chapter that we're studying today. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them from the hand, or by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant. And I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none of his brothers, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. In that he says, a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now that is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, why did I find it necessary to go back and read that? We studied that last week and, and we studied it in depth, but I felt it was necessary to go back and read that section of verses because of the way the chapter 9 begins. First two words we say, it says, then indeed. So based upon what we've studied before this point, up to this point, there, there is, again, more points to be made. And in chapter 9, we, we, we are continuing on with this uh, comparison. Let me go through these slides real quick uh, and get into our study. As Donnie has been telling us, the book is broken up into two different sections. Uh, you see on the, the board before you there. Today we're down in the... Uh, point B3 and B4, where we're talking about the superiority of Christ's sanctuary and the superiority of Christ's sacrifice as contrasted with the old covenant, the old law, the old sacrifices, the old worship, ministry, practices, whatever phrase that you want to use. And that's where we are uh, beginning in our study today. And then again, we're in this section where, where he is speaking to them about doctrine, and then where he'll be switching later to where he'll be talking to them about a, a warning based upon that better covenant, those better sacrifices. And that's in the section that we're in today. Okay, that's the review of chapters. Okay, here we go. This is the outline that we're going to be using for the, the, the book of uh, Hebrews chapter 9. We're in the first section there, the tabernacle of the first covenant pointed to a better, verses 1 through 10. And that's where we begin in chapter 9 here, verses 1 through 10. So we have this, this contrast going on between the old and the new covenants in verses 1 through 14 in the chapter. And... Uh, the practices, the rituals, the, the worship of the old covenant versus the new covenant and the perfect sacrifice that we have through Christ. So let's, let's begin in verse 1. Um, uh, here we are. It will be good to bring this slide up for you to take a look at while we're looking at this first section, verses 1 through 6, where it's talking about the tabernacle. Now, uh, we see in verse 1, our author says that, the, Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. Now, he's referring to the, the, the old tabernacle, the old service, the old covenant, the way that it was uh, administered, and we see that it was ordinances of divine service. What does that mean to you? Of divine service. Who established all this? Who established the way that they were going to be practicing? God did. 
And we had that referred to us back in, in chapter 8 also, but we see here that it was established by God. And uh, again, we see that uh, by the quote that's given to us in chapter 8, when we go back to the book of Jeremiah, and we see that that is what was established at that time. This was established by God himself, the way that he set down, first of all, the tabernacle, how it was to be constructed, how the priests were about to go about their service in that tabernacle, the things that they would do in, inside that tabernacle. That was all established by God in that first covenant, in that earthly sanctuary, which we refer to as the tabernacle. So he says in verse 2, for a tabernacle was prepared, and he's, then he starts talking about the physical structure of this tabernacle. And we see that, uh, uh, what do we refer to as a tabernacle? What was its purpose at the time it was established? I know that's a broad question. I'm looking for any answer you're going to throw out. Okay, a place for worship to uh, be conducted, a place for the, the, the people to meet with God, especially the high priest when he went to the most holy place. It was a sacred tent, yeah. Was it, what I'm trying to get you to go toward, it was temporary. It was a, a, a structure that was meant to be set up, taken down, moved to another place and set up again and then taken down and moved to another place. So it was a temporary structure. It was never meant to be a permanent structure uh, as we read about it in the Old Testament. So at, at beginning in verse 2, we see uh, a list being provided to us about the structure of this and what was this uh, tabernacle and what was contained in it. Uh, it's not a complete list, but it's a simple list with the majority of the items that were maintained in there listed for us. We see that uh, it says in the first part, and according to our, our diary room up here, um, we know that through, through our studies in the past of the, the Old Testament that the whole tabernacle was brought, broken it up into two rooms. The first room here, which was called the holy place, and then the second room behind this veil was called the most holy place, the holiest of all, the holy place, just depending on where, what version you're, you're using or what uh, passage of scripture that you might be reading. And he's referring to this part right here, the first part in verse 2. So he says in the first part, which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. So we see what was contained in that first section there, the holy, uh, the sanctuary referred to here, the holy place. In verse 3, he talks about him behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all. And depending on what translation you may be reading, it might say holy of holies or most holy place. Uh, can be referred to any of those. And contained in that second part, uh, it says that uh, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, which is where the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant were contained. And in verse 5, and above it were the cherubim of the glory overshadowing the mercy seat. So we, we see the, what's being told to us was present inside the second part, the most holy place, uh, in reference to what the organization of the tabernacle. Now, if you remember, again, the tabernacle's temporary, and if you remember the history and what the Bible tells us, that the, the temple, uh, the Jerusalem was captured, and the temple was uh, destroyed by who? The first time. Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, and that was in approximately 586 to 587 B.C. So the temple was, uh, the physical temple was um, captured and destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians before they took the children of Israel into captivity. What's significant about that? Again, I'm on this side, I know. I, I got my mind running off in one direction. Yeah. 
Yes, and we've read that. That's, that is absolutely true. Again, this, this earthly, this physical, to either whether it be the ta uh, tabernacle or the temples that were built by man, those were a shadow of what was to come in, in heaven, the permanent, the temporary versus the permanent. When the, uh, when the temple was destroyed by the Babylonians and they took all the spoils back with them to Babylonia and Cyrus allowed them to come back and they reestablished the, 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 taber or the, the temple again, what did not come back with them? Okay, it's not what I'm looking for, but that's true. Physically, what physically didn't come up, did not come back with them? The Ark of the Covenant or any of the contents of the Ark of the Covenant that was lost, destroyed, whatever, uh, whatever happened to it, it did not come back with them. And that's significant for us to remember that because in our study today, he's going back all the way to the tabernacle. He didn't go back to the physical temple that was in, standing there that day or the one that was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. He goes back to the original tabernacle to, to establish the practices that were going on at that time versus what was going on that day. So we know that the, for, through our studies, the high priest goes into the most holy place once, once a year. When the tabernacle was there, the mercy seat was there, the Ark of the Covenant was there, Aaron's bu uh, rod, that bud was there, the tablets of the covenant were there. In the present day at that time, those things weren't in there. So essentially the high priest is going into, the room, into an empty room. I don't, I don't know if that's significant to you, but that's just something for you to consider. As our, our, our author here is going through this, this list of things that would have been uh, present in the tabernacle. So I think that's why he goes all the way back to the tabernacle to make this comparison between the way that the old was versus the way the new is going to be. Any comments up to this point? Yes. Uh, you know, I, as I was studying for this today, uh, and that was one of the, the uh, workbooks that I read to try to help me prepare for this class, they had the, the, that author made the point that the room was empty because the ark was destroyed, lost, whatever the case may be, and that never found again up to this current day. All right, let me go back to the other slide now. Yes. Okay. That's one possible thought. Another possible thought is, uh, in, in, in you're referring to the, the latter part of verse 5, of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Um, I think what that probably means is that the, the writer here could have continued to go on with about the details, the minute details of what occurred and what happened back in the, in the day of the tabernacle. But that's not the purpose of this, this writing at this time, not to go into the way that it used to be. He's trying to steer them into what it's, it is or is going to be through Christ. And that, that may be, this is not the time to be talking further detail about this. That's, that's another thought that, that might be occurring here where he says there in verse 5 at the end, uh, we cannot speak in detail. There's, there's not a reason to go into further detail is kind of what I think that he's saying here. Any other comments? Yes. Yes, yes, the old leading to the new. Just like the old, the old Testament, the purpose of the Old Testament was to lead those people to the Messiah the, under the new covenant. All that leads toward this. Okay, um, point B up there, we get into the, to this, the next section, verses 6 through 10. Um, 
where, again, where the, the, the first pointed toward the second. Now, uh, we see in, in verse 6 here, Now, when these things had been thus prepared, the priest always went into the first place of the tabernacle, performing the services. Now, if you go back and look at what the, the priest did, we know that the, part of their duties was to take care of the lampstand, to bring the oil in, to make sure that it burned continually, provided light to the interior of the, the tabernacle. Uh, they went in and uh, replaced the showbread on the table as, as necessary. Uh, they went in and did the incense. Uh, so there were, there were many things that the priests did as part of their duties uh, under, under the old law in, in the tabernacle. And that's where he talks about here. They always went into the first part. What's the emphasis here? For the normal priests, they went no further. They only went into the first part because of the restriction of who was, who was allowed into the second part. Only the high priest. And how often did he go in there? Once a year. And we know that if anybody else tried to go in there and to look inside that area, that God would punish them. Um, that in verse 7 here, but in the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. So remember that the, the first part and the second part are divided by that veil, and the only person allowed beyond that veil is the high priest once a year, and the purpose of him going in there was to do what? Okay, first he offered a sacrifice of blood for himself. And then he came in with another sacrifice of blood for the people. So we see this, again, we're trying, he's trying to lead the people in this, this line of thought that this is all the things that occurred under the old covenant in the tabernacle. There were continual sacrifices. Uh, the the priests offered sacrifices. We know we had an altar on the outside of the temple that were daily sacrifices were given. Then there's the sacrifice that's given by the high priest inside the most holy place once a year for himself and for the people. Uh, again, reemphasize here in verse 7, that was once a year. In verse 8, the Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest when the first tabernacle was still standing. Uh, I'm reading from the New King James Version, and uh, the, was not yet made manifest is another way of saying it, it wasn't known at that time. Uh, remember that the, only the high priest could enter into that area, and that was once a year, but when Christ, the perfect sacrifice, was given on the cross and he, he gave up his life and was a perfect sacrifice, what event happened that we remember in reference to one of the items in, inside the, the tabernacle? The, uh huh. From top to bottom. And we have that recorded for us uh, in, in um, Matthew chapter 27, verse 51. And at that time, the way became known to everyone because that veil was done away with. The old law was done away with, and we have the new covenant in place at this time through Christ's death. And later in our study this morning, we'll learn more about that. Uh, so in verse 9, it was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performs service perfect in regard to the conscience. Under the old law, the sacrifices that were given... What could they not do that Christ's sacrifice could? Right. Okay, so under the old law, sins were never completely done away with. The blood of bulls and goats, the, the animal sacrifices that were made, essentially we could use the term they, they covered over the sins of, that had been uh, um, 
Yes, they did, and that, that was the point. They, it covered over those sins, but they didn't, it didn't do away with them, and then the next year they had to do another sacrifice for the sins that had, been, uh, had occurred from that time to over the year. And it had to be done again, and then it had to be get done again. And we see, again, he's leading them down that road, that thought process where he's trying to lead them to why Christ is so much better. Um, so the sins couldn't be completely purged. They couldn't be completely forgiven. Uh, they were essentially just covered up. And uh, they remembered those from year to year as they pr provided these, these additional sacrifices over time. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 3 says, uh, But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year. And that was the purpose of the high priest and, uh, going into that area and making that sacrifice for them because there would be a remembrance of sins every year. Uh, verse 10. Well, let's go back to verse 9. Um, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. Again, couldn't wipe those sins away, couldn't forgive those sins so that they were present. And the conscience could not be clear at that time. Verse 10, uh, concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings and fleshy ordinances imposed until the time of the Reformation or the time of the change. So all these practices that, that were referred to here about the way that they, uh, concerning foods and drinks, the, the washings, the fleshly ordinances were only temporary until we have Christ come on the scene. Any comments up to that point? Again, we see how, as the last point in there, it's pointing towards something that's coming that is better, better than all these old things that they had been practicing for all those years. Something that is better. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Because we'll see this later in our study this morning. How many times is Christ sacrificed? Once. Doesn't have to be done over and over and over and over and over and over and over. It's had to be done once for all time. Okay, so um, we see this, this, this time of change that we're referring to, the time of Reformation, and that's where verse 11 begins for us. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and the more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. It's not fleshly. It's not made with physical hands. It's not made by man. But it's heavenly. It's spiritual. It's so much better. Uh, and that's the point that is, is being made here, that Christ came as our high priest uh, and of the good things to come which is greater and perfect, more perfect tabernacle. Not with the blood of bulls and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having attained eternal redemption. So again, we, we, we see this contrast between the, the old tabernacle worship, the sacrifices, the practices of that time, versus Christ's sacrifices, our high priest, where it was perfect, where it was offered for one time only, and once and for, uh, for everyone. Uh, in verse 13, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled the unclean, sacrifices for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ? So we, we have this, 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 um, these practices, this, this outward things that were accomplished that could not forgive sins. Um, and required, you remember that sin always requires a sacrifice, for life is in the blood. So, in Christ's case, his sacrifice was the perfect sacrifice, and again, only had to be accomplished once. Comments up to this point? Okay, verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot, to God, cleanse your conscience from good work to serve the living God. 
What are dead works? Cleanse your conscience from dead works. What causes death? Sin does. So can we not say here that dead works are sin? Dead works equals sin. And in this, this point that the perfect sacrifice of shedding of Christ's blood now affords them the opportunity to have their conscience clean from dead works? Yes. So we have that not, now are these, since they're not just covered, they're not remembered from year to year to year to year, they're forgiven. They're not remembered anymore from that point. Verse 15, for this reason he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So this refers us back to uh, chapter 8, verse 6, where it talks about a better covenant based upon better promises. And we see this uh, through Christ being our mediator of the new covenant. And by his death, the new covenant becomes in effect, becomes active, effective. Um, we also see uh, through this verse, Donnie put this slide together in, in his presentation, and we see that uh, in verse 15 here, he is the mediator of a new covenant by means of death for the redemption of transgressions under the first covenant. What's another way that we can restate that? Christ being the perfect sacrifices does what? Okay, and we it specifically refers to those under the old law. Now remember, under the old law, their sins were never washed away, or they never were completely done away with. Under the new law, they can be through the sacrifice that Christ made, through the shedding of his blood. So the, the easiest way that we say that day is it flows backwards and it flows forward. So it not only takes care of sins that may be committed here in the present, even in the future, but it also takes care of those that were committed in the past by people that came before us. And, and what did, does it take for that to occur? For you and I, for people in the future, for those in the past. Blood of Jesus had to be sacrificed, that's true, but how, I don't know if I'm asking this right. We today access it through being baptized into Christ, becoming a member of his church. Those under the old law didn't have that opportunity. But how do they have the opportunity to have their sins forgiven? If they had been obedient to the law under the old covenant. So those are the two verses. Let's, let's go ahead and take a quick read of those. Somebody already returned to Romans chapter 3. If you are, go ahead and read that, please. Okay, and then that's talking about under the old law in Hebrews 9.15, which uh, we're seeing today in our study. Okay, so we have these two verses showing that, that the perfect sacrifice of Christ takes care of all, past, present, and future, through obedience, through repentance. Uh, we have to keep those in mind, too. Um, beginning in verse 16, let me go back to my slides. Beginning in verse 16 uh, is... Uh, 
the presentation that uh, for where there is a testament, there must also be the death of the testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. That not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. What's this, these few verses here saying? A common practice that we have here today. I have a will that I, I have drawn up so that when I pass away, all my belongings go to Anita. She has a will also that says that if she passes away, then it goes, gets split evenly between our three kids. So for all that to go into action, what has to happen? For a will to go into, to be applied and be put into action, the testator, the person that put that will together has to pass away, has to die. And that's what we're having explained to us here. A common thing that we all understand that for the new covenant to come into effect, Christ had to die. He had, had to be that sacrifice that was given. Just like under the old law, there always had to be a blood sacrifice given for it to take effect. Uh, verse 19. For when Moses had spoken to every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. And that is a quote from... Say again? Yes, Exodus chapter 24. This particular verse, this statement here is in verse 8. So this was established by God again, say, stating that a, a blood sacrifice had to be given. Then likewise, in verse 21, he sprinkled with both blood of the tabernacle and all the ministry. Uh, that's again what was applied under the Old Testament. Verse 22, and according to the law, almost all things were purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Still, he's, he's guiding them toward this target, or they're showing to them that Christ is the better. The new covenant is the better covenant, uh, especially because of the results of the perfect sacrifice being given. One of the things that, that was noted in, when I was studying it, it says here in the first uh, part of verse 22 it says almost all was purified by blood and that could be a reference to that there were some things that were purified by water there were some things that were referred to as being purified by fire and you can uh, find those in, in Numbers chapter 30, 31 and Leviticus chapter 15 so I think that's where almost all is being applied there because other things were uh, uh, purified by other means Verse 23, therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Again, carrying on this argument, a blood sacrifice was always required in the earthly tabernacle. A blood sacrifice was required in the heavenly tabernacle. And as was stated before, there was always required a blood sacrifice to be offered. What's significant about this new one, you already know, is better is because it only had to occur once because of the perfect sacrifice that uh, was offered. Verse 24, for Christ has entered not only the, uh, not only the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Okay. I always find it difficult to keep up on the slides, so that's why I'm trying to stay focused on them for you. Um, being stated for, again to, for us, the comparison between the old and the new, remember that the high priest under the old law had to continually enter into the most holy place. Christ is entering into the heavenly tabernacle. He's only having to do it once, and then he's there uh, offering that sacrifice to God uh, in the holiest of all places in, in heaven. Uh, verse 25, not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. Again, the contrast that this was a multiple versus a single sacrifice. 
if that was true, then he, in verse 26, he would then, he would have, he then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once, at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Uh, end of the ages, uh, we've heard the phrase in other passages in the New Testament talking about the last days. What is that referring to? In the last days, what has happened? Right, that's correct. The days that we're living in now, um, where God has revealed his full gospel to us, he's revealed the plan of redemption to us, has shown us what's required of us, and is... Yes, it is. It is. The new, when it, it's been put into effect, what happens to the old? It's abolished. It's done away with. It's, it's no longer required. Uh, you would, will not apply it. You're going to be doing things under the new covenant. Um, verse 27. And it was appointed for men to die once. After this, the judgment. We all know that's a true statement. But is that what's being referred to? Is they all of, that, uh, all of a sudden switched to talking about you and I? We got to die once. Yes, Jesus was a man, was he not? He died. He died once. He was raised. The difference between him and us uh, until the day of judgment comes. We're not going to be raised. When the day of judgment comes, we will be raised. But. Again, this contrast between the old and new, multiple versus a singular event, um, it's not required of Christ. He was raised from the dead and he's in heaven now, seated on the right hand of God. So in verse 28, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart for sin for salvation. Um, Revised Standard Version states this, this as this way. Christ and then will appear a second time not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting for him. Christ has already dealt with sin. He's taken care of that. He doesn't have to deal with it again. So the next time that he appears, he's, he's uh, um, going to... Take care of those who really wait to see him and to arrive and offer salvation to them. Um, Christ's death was sufficient. It only was required once. It was adequate to achieve the purpose that it was designed for. And it was once for all versus the many under the old covenant. Um, it's about, we've got about a minute. Anybody have any further comments on that? Questions? All right, if not, I appreciate your participation. It made it a little bit easier on me. Uh, say that again. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much.